Thank you all. It's my pleasure indeed to introduce now Mr. Ben Roberts from Knoxville, Tennessee and a first class at the United States Air Force Academy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet First Class Ben Roberts from the Air Force Academy. And today I'll be introducing Steve Ritchie. Steve Ritchie is the only Air Force Academy fighter pilot ace. The only Air Force pilot ace in over 65 years. And the only American pilot ever to down five MiG-21s enemy fighter airplanes. He flew over 800 hours of combat during 339 missions in Southeast Asia. He is the 1973 winner of the McKay Trophy for the most significant Air Force Mission of the Year and numerous other awards. Veteran Tributes ranks General Ritchie as the fifth most decorated living American of all time. He was a member of the 1963 Falcon Football, go Air Force, Gator Bowl team and the Air Force Academy class of 1964. We now have a short video to further introduce our speaker. Accomplished pilot, businessman, and motivational speaker. As a command pilot with more than 4,000 flying hours, including 800 in combat, General Ritchie is the first and only Air Force pilot ace since the Korean War and the only American pilot in history to down five MiG-21s. Born in Reedsville, North Carolina, Steve Ritchie was an honor student and football standout as a high school quarterback. Ritchie entered the Air Force Academy in 1960, graduating in 64 with a B.S. in engineering science. While there, he was a football walk-on and made the team as a starting halfback for the Falcons, playing his final game in the 1963 Gator Bowl. Ritchie then entered pilot training at Laredo, Texas, and graduated first in his class. His initial assignment was at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, flying F-104 Starfighters. In 1968, Ritchie served as an F-4 aircraft commander at Da Nang Air Base, Vietnam, where he flew the first F-4 fast forward air controller mission in Vietnam. He was instrumental in the spread of the fast FAC program throughout Southeast Asia. It proved to be one of the most successful operations of the entire conflict. In 1969, he completed the Air Force Top Gun Fighter Weapons School in the Phantom and became one of the youngest instructors in the history of the school. Ritchie volunteered for a second tour in Southeast Asia in 1972 and compiled an aviation record that will likely never be equaled. He shot down a MiG-21 on May 10th and another on May 31st. He downed two more MiG-21s on July 8th in a classic low-altitude dogfight that lasted 89 seconds. Steve was victorious again on August 28th while flying his 339th combat mission, making him the Air Force's first and only pilot ace since the Korean War and the only American pilot in history to down five MiG-21s. At the urging of Senator Barry Goldwater, then Major Ritchie left active duty in April 1974 to run for U.S. House of Representatives from his home state of North Carolina. Thereafter, he worked as special assistant to Joseph Coors for the next six years and was promoted to lieutenant colonel while serving in the Colorado Air National Guard. Ritchie transferred to the Air Force Reserves in 1985, holding positions in the Pentagon. In 1994, he was promoted to Brigadier General and served as mobilization assistant to the commander of Air Force recruiting. In 1997, Ritchie flew an active duty F-4E Phantom at the Air Force 50th anniversary show and has flown the only privately owned Phantom more than 100 times at air shows and special events. He is currently the only pilot to be FAA type rated in the F-104 Starfighter more than 40 years after having flown the world's fastest low-altitude jet. Today, General Ritchie travels, speaking about aviation, national security, and America's free market system as president of Steve Ritchie Associates, Inc. Brigadier General Ritchie is one of the most decorated pilots in Air Force history, having been awarded the Air Force Cross, four silver stars, 10 distinguished flying crosses, and 25 air medals. Why, that was
was good. My mother did a nice job on that film, don't you think? Let's see, I think I've got a shot of her here. There she goes. She would have believed every word of it. Now, Dad, uh, who was in Patton's Third Army in World War II, I don't know about Dad. He, he might have had some questions. Uh, ben, I, uh, I want to thank you for not telling the score of that Air Force Carolina football game in the Gator Bowl of 63. Uh, no one here remembers it. I've been trying to forget it for, let's see, that was uh, 28 December 63, so 03 would have been 40, 13 would have been 50, 18 would have been 55. So that's 55 years, nine months, and 28 days, right? Is that right? Have any uh, math majors in here? F 55 years, <laughs> nine months, and 28 days. I've been trying to forget that darn thing. So like I said, I was a halfback at the Air Force Academy. This last game took place against one of my home state teams, University of North Carolina. And I just thought that'd be the greatest way in the world to end 11 years of organized football. Well, as tradition would have it, after the game, they gave us a watch. It had a little football and an alligator in the middle of it. And every time I looked at mine, it read 35 to nothing. <laughs> Sir, don't blame me for not laughing. Now, that was the score of the ball game. We didn't think it was too funny either. Now, that season was not a total loss. Uh, we don't have any Nebraska fans here that would admit it, do we? Big Red fans? You, 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 you're not, you're not going to like this story. <laughs> we, meaning this little Air Force team, traveled to Lincoln, Nebraska the fall of 63, about mid-October. Nebraska was undefeated and nationally ranked. We were unranked. We didn't have a chance of being ranked. We outweighed over 50 pounds per person. We won that game in the last two minutes. Now think about it. To beat the Big Red in Lincoln when they're undefeated and in the top 10, we had to get out of town in a hurry. <laughs> it's the only game Nebraska lost, 63 season. They beat Auburn in the Orange Bowl. They ended up number five in the nation. We denied them the national championship. Some people, yeah, yeah, there we go. Ready? Now, that season was not a total loss, uh, once again, because we uh, were able to whip up on Nebraska. Um, but another reason I'm happy to be here is that in April of 1972, I really shouldn't have made it. On my very first mission over Hanoi, 16 April 72, there were three SAMs. Some of you know that's a surface-to-air missile about the size of a telephone pole. They were accelerated up at our airplanes at some 1,600, 2,000 miles an hour. They would proximity fuse, detonate, and be lethal, be deadly within about uh, 200, 400 feet. And on my very first mission, three of them came within about 100 feet of my airplane, failed to go off, failed to go off, failed to detonate. Thank goodness for that Soviet quality control, would you agree? <laughs> but there are many other times, and really had it not been for thousands and thousands of people in the entire military and civilian support community who were, who were, who were proud of their work, who performed it in a professional, outstanding manner. Steve Ritchie would not be a fighter ace, and I probably would not be alive. So as you can imagine, I'm, I'm pretty darn thankful. Pretty grateful, feel very fortunate to receive so much of the credit that belongs to so many who helped make it all possible. You see, there are many fighter pilots who could have done what I did. But we had a unique opportunity in the air combat arena. And there were some reasons for our success at the time, given that opportunity. And of course, you know what they are. Preparation, teamwork, discipline, dedication, education, training, communication, Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. <laughs> it's after lunch, right? Attitude. 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 
will, determination, and <laughs> integrity. And surely most of you will agree that those are the elements, the ingredients, the keys that go into the makeup of what? Success, achievement, quality, excellence, top gun performance, and anything that we do, personal or professional. So in the final analysis, it's people in a wide array of support functions who are trained and motivated and ready and willing to do the job, who ultimately make it possible for us to win rather than to lose, to succeed rather than to fail, and sometimes, sometimes to live rather than to die. And that gets to be pretty important, doesn't it? Let's see, Jim is not here, is he? Jim Roberts? Now, Jim was Navy. Um, we've already played Navy this year. It didn't work out too well, right? Huh? But we've got Army coming up. So that, that, uh, that should be a piece of cake, right? So I'm always teasing Jim. Now, Jim's been running this program for 22 years. You know, this is a 22nd year. Did you know that? This program? Most of you weren't even born. So anyway, Jim, I'm always asking Jim. Uh, Jim, is, a, is, a, is, a, uh, is the Navy a part of the Marines? Yeah. And, uh, but... One of, the, one of the Marines were telling me that they represent the men's department of the Navy. <laughs> you've, you've, you've heard that one, right? Huh? Yeah. yeah. I did have a chance to fly with one of these Marines. Where are you? Where are the Marines? Had a chance to fly with one of these Marines one time. We got some bad weather. We had to make an instrument approach into the field. We finally broke out under the weather. He tried to land on a runway that was 150 feet long and 10,000 feet wide. Who was it that didn't get that Gator Bowl joke? Anyway, I didn't see him now. Had a little trouble getting it stopped. And the great thing is the Marines believe they can do it, don't they? <laughs> and our friends in the Navy do it every day as a matter of course, right? You know what one of your Navy friends was telling me why you have to worry when a Marine throws a pin at you? Probably has a grenade in his mouth. And, and, and Craig, you said they weren't any fun. No, I'm teasing. General Patton. John Patton said, we fight with machinery, but we win with people. We win with people. And I really am convinced that people can and will do great things. They'll reach for the stars when motivated by inspired leadership. And I'd like to tell you for just a few minutes about three of the great leaders that I had the wonderful privilege to fly with and work for. The Wing Commander at Udorn, Thailand, 1972, was a young colonel named Charlie Gabriel. Ten years later, he was the chief of our Air Force. The vice wing commander was Jerry O'Malley. He became the vice chief. He was commander of Pacific Air Command, then commander of Tactical Air Command when he was tragically killed in an airplane accident in the spring of 1985. He would surely have been the chief. There was an Army One Star there with whom we worked. Began his career in the enlisted ranks of the Minnesota National Guard and became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Jack Vesey. These three people, these three individuals had that, I don't know what you call it, I talk about it so much I don't want to name it. 
It's that special quality, I guess, that inspires the desire for excellence in almost everyone who's around him. You know people like that? We'd have done mo almost anything for Charlie Gable, Jerry O'Malley, Jack Vesey. And I know a lot of people find this next statement hard to understand. Maybe some of you will. Maybe you know it to be true. I would have died for them. So would many of my colleagues. I think it's here. And some did. Some did. That's a pretty special brand of loyalty, isn't it? Because I'll tell you what, there are a lot of people I don't feel that way about. A whole lot of people. What is it? Have you thought about it very much? What is it that commands such loyalty? Well, a part of it was, is we admired them. We respected them. We loved them. We did. We'd have done almost anything for them. And yet, maybe more important than anything else, we knew that loyalty cut both ways. We knew when things really got tight, when we got into a jam, into a bind, we could count on them. Just as much as they knew they could count on us. That loyalty cut both ways. And it's so important for us to think about what is it in others that inspires us to do our best and to be our best? And then try to be that way for those who look to us for leadership and guidance and counsel and inspiration. It's kind of like the author who wrote, I love you not only for what you are, but for what I am when I'm around you. No, for, for what I am when I'm around you. Don't you see, we were better people when we were around Charlie Gable, Jerry O'Malley, Jack Vesey. We did a better job. We worked harder, communicated better, more creative, more productive. You know what else? We had a hell of a lot more fun. Because it is fun to work for people like that, isn't it? Those of us in leadership and management and supervisory positions have such important responsibilities. Because we have either a very positive, a very mediocre, or a very negative effect on people and the lives of people. That's what? Performance, productivity, creativity, communication, bottom line mission accomplishment. Bill Danforth, the founder of Ralston Purina, always used to challenge the people in his company to stand tall, to think tall, to smile tall, and to live tall. Aren't these the kind of people we have in the room here today? If not, aren't they the kind we want? Why? Because you're up. You're proud. You're happy. You're courteous. You communicate better. You like to work. I know it's a new concept in many quarters these days, isn't it? Unfortunately. You like to work. And that spirit is contagious. And the score for Vagabond King, Rudolph Frommel, wrote, Give me ten who are stout-hearted, and soon I'll give you ten thousand more. That spirit is contagious. Now, many ask about the 8th of July, 1972, when we're down two MiG-21s in a minute, 29 seconds. Because it's such a great example of how all of the elements of the team effort come together to produce an incredible victory. I wish I had video or color film to show. Anyone see the movie Top Gun? That was a lot like, well, part of what you saw in Top Gun. Maybe some of the ladies are thinking about Tom Cruise. Val Kilmer, Val Kilmer, Batman. No, 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 Iceman, Iceman. <laughs> well, he was good in Batman, too. Anyway, the last thing that happened about that morning before we catch is the crew chief came up the ladder to let me know we didn't have any film for the camera. Reggie Taylor. I said, what do you mean, chief? There's no film. He said, well, to film, there's no film on base. That was an F4E model with a gun and a gun camera. There's a pointer there somewhere. All right. There's the gun. Uh, most of the time, I was in a D model. There we go, without a gun camera. So anyway, he said, we're out of film. There's no film on base. I thought about it for a moment. 
I said, I guess that's okay. I, I doubt we'll see MIGs today anyway. See, we never know, do we? Another good lesson, isn't it? Because we never know what's just around the corner. We never know what's just over the horizon. And that's why it's so important to be as prepared as we can possibly be in every area in our lives. Because we never know and we need to be ready. And as I was talking with some of the cadets during the break, I think it's probably more important today than it's ever been with the upset world in which we live, the challenges to freedom that we face and the people all over the world who are yearning to be free, the challenges that they face. So you guys really have important work ahead of you. And there are a bunch of us who are proud to have gone before you and, and ho hopefully uh, paved the way. There were certainly many that I showed you a few that I looked up to so much that were helpful to me. But the whole point is, it never has been more important. Now let me spend just uh, the last few minutes and we get to the most important part and uh, tell you about the Locker rescue. Roger Locker was shot down on the 10th of May in 1972 and for 22 days there was no word. We carry survival radios right here in our survival vest, one on each side, lots of extra batteries. I think that picture's, there it is. I don't know why it's at the end. See the batteries, these extra batteries and radios. There are radios here and batteries. Because there's no way to make that rescue without the communication link. Proper communication is so important in every single thing that we do every day, all day long, isn't it? Think about the problems caused, the time, the money, the effort, the resources wasted on miscommunication. It's unbelievable. We went back in that afternoon and called and called on the radio. There was no answer. We went in for days thereafter. There was never any reply. We finally decided that he must have been killed or captured. Yet he never came out on a captured list that the North Vietnamese like to publish every few days. Well, 22 days later, we're flying in the same area that's breaking the radio chatter. You can imagine with 20 or 30 people all on the same fre frequency, all trying to talk at the same time. It does get a little busy, would you guess? And I've got a few seconds of tape to try to give you a feel for what it sounds like under those circumstances. Now, the problem is this tape is from over 40 years ago, but it's a copy of a copy, and this recorder is over 30 years old. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So if I touch it just right, maybe I can get it to work. And we'll give it a couple of tries here. Are these not on? They are. All right. Um, you couldn't understand that, right? So Hopefully, I'm going to be able to get that last part. The last part, this is T-Ball on guard. Be advised we have blue bandits crossing into Laos at this time. They should be high altitude, all aircraft heads up. Uh, blue bandit being a MiG-21. So I'm going to try to play that over and listen very carefully and see if you can hear some of the words. Got to touch it just right. Okay. Anyway, there's a break in the radio chatter. Call came over the air. Any Allied aircraft? This is Oyster 01 Bravo. I remember thinking Oyster. 
we don't have an oyster call sign today. Then we realized that's, that's Roger Locker. We answered him. This is exactly what he said. He said, guys, uh, I've been down here a long time. Any chance of picking me up? <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? I don't believe I'd have been that cool after 22 days, do you? We said, you bet. You bet. Went back to our respective bases that afternoon, quickly planned a rescue mission. We came back in. He was five miles off the end of the runway at Yen Bai Airfield. There it is, Yen Bai. Right there, see it? Some 60 miles northwest of Hanoi. See a little airfield there? Five miles off the end of the run by at Yen Bai Airfield. As I said, some 60 miles northwest of Hanoi. And then, um, Captain Dale Stovall commanded a lead of two Jolly Green Giant helicopters. And I'm always so proud to tell this story because Dale was a freshman when I was a senior at the Air Force Academy. Well, you guessed it, I had quite a bit to do with his summer training program his first year. Dale commanded the lead of these two, two Jolly Greens, came in, the PJ sent the jungle penetrator down through a heavy canopy of trees and snatched Roger Locker as he was about to be captured. Headed out, we flew cover for the two Jolly Greens, their C-130 refueling tankers as they made their way out of North Vietnam. Brought him all the way back to Udorn, Thailand. General Vogt flew up in a T-39 from Saigon. It was the fir first of several hundred of us to meet him as he stepped off that chopper after 23 days. The flight surgeons, the doctors, the nurses, the medics, the chaplains quickly, quickly took him off to the hospital. But they did say he could come to the club that night. 1900 hours, 7 p.m. for 30 minutes, and the word spread. And the club was totally jam packed. And at 7 p.m., Roger Locker washed, fed, shaven, and dressed in a uniform that we used to call our party suit, walked in the front door. Applause broke out that lasted for over 20 minutes. As he made his way through the crowd, shaking hands with friends. A magnificent experience of human emotion. An incredible victory. A total force joint rescue victory against all odds and no losses. And when we think about that and analyze it and compare it, say, to the theme of that movie, Platoon, which suggested that we shoot each other in the back, and then we come to fully understand the effort to which we will go, the resources we will commit, the risks that we will take to rescue one crew member, one American, one ally. Isn't it a very powerful statement about what kind of people we are? About the value that we place on life, on freedom, and on the individual. I really got to find this because uh, Roger Locker and I were members of a famous Air Force fighter squadron called the Triple Nickel, as I mentioned. He was rescued on the 2nd of June, 1972. He'd been down for 23 days, 23 years later to the day, 2nd of June of 95. Another member of the Triple Nickel, a generation later flying an F-16 out of Aviano, Italy. Captain Scott O'Grady was shot down over Bosnia. And of course, you know the rest of the story. Another total force joint rescue victory. And by the way, those young Marines that went in on the final leg of that joint service rescue effort to pick up Air Force Captain Scott O'Grady, Average age, 19 years old. How about a round for the Marines?
do that very often. <laughs> 16 minutes left. We'll probably take about 20. Um, so, folks, bottom line, what we're talking about is the fight to be free, the never-ending struggle for people to be free. Mariana grew up in Romania under a brutal communist dictator for 20 years before her dad escaped and made it to America and then later the communists said they were going to keep her mother and her sister and they could rot under communism. But thanks to President Reagan and some other efforts, they were able to lead out. And as a little girl, she dreamed of America and freedom and what it might be like to be free in the USA. And she's going to tell you about it, a little bit about it. At first sight, I'm just a general little wife. But beyond that, I am the oppressed that you rescued America. And the American, the proud American who fights alongside you to keep our freedom from slipping through our fingers. I come from a communist Romania and a very oppressed Romania. We used to think that once we get to America, we're going to be safe forever. We wouldn't have never guessed that we have to fight the same enemy, socialism and communism, all over again here in the land of the free. Um, communists believed in spreading the wealth, take from the ones who worked, give to the poor. That paralyzed the economy. It does not work. Don't try it. Don't even think about it. It will save you a lot of heartache. Because those, those who work don't want to work when most of it gets taken away, given to the government. The poor didn't want to work because they were getting something for nothing. And that only lasted until they ran out of other people's money. And then everybody was equally poor. Um, the first thing the communists did, they made guns illegal because unarmed people are so much easier to control and oppress. Knowing that my grandfather was a priest, we were threatened with all kinds of things for going to church um, as children. And we went just out of spite, and it was not courage. It was des desperation. We wanted to provoke them. We wanted them to come get us, kill us, get it done and over with. Because life without freedom was hell. Um, we couldn't say Merry Christmas. We had to say Happy Holidays. No Christmas trees, but holiday trees. The socialist health care killed many. One of my first memories of, uh, as a child was holding the hand of a dying man who was a friend and a neighbor. And um, my grandma crying, saying there's nothing more we can do for him, just help him die. All he needed was a simple uh, procedure, which here in America is an outpatient procedure. Over there, he was considered too old to even try and save. And he was only in his 60s. When I asked my grandma how old I was when that happened, she said I was five years old. And the look of death in his eyes is still haunting me. And uh, the, I remember holding his hand and thinking how quickly it got cold and stiff. It's, it's incredible. And um, I'm here to warn you. I'm living proof that you do not want the government in your life. The less government is, is in your life, the more freedom you have. You have the power. Don't give it away to somebody sitting in an office who doesn't even know you exist. You're just a number to them. They can't possibly just use your common sense. They cannot possibly 
take care of you as well as you would take care of yourself, given the freedom to do so. Um, everything was overregulated. If you wanted to move from one city to another, you needed permission from the government. If you wanted to have a landline, you needed permission from the government. Uh, to get married, you had to be approved. Um, through all that madness, I, ha you ha I had to have something that would keep me going, that would um, a kind of an escape. So I had the picture of the American flag that I cut out of a magazine smuggled, foreign magazine smuggled into the country. And um, many times I would take it out and stare at it and dream of what it would be like to be free, to, to eat a hamburger. We had no hamburgers. What ketchup would taste like or cheesecake and I tried to imagine it to the smallest detail. And that made me feel better, helped me um, keep on going. And I made the mistake to take it to class. And um, somebody must have told, because the teacher came to me to take it away. I was able to hide it before it was taken away from me. And I did not surrender the American flag in spite of all the threats, I was going to die before I would have surrendered the flag because I knew it was going to be destroyed. And I didn't care whether I lived or died, but I could not lose that hope. That's all I had that kept me going. And then, years later, we're in America, and guess what's on TV? Some Americans burn their own flag, burn the American flag that I was going to die for. And that hurt me in places I never knew existed. I did not expect that. I expected the communists to be evil, and that was fine, that was normal, I could deal with that. But you see, the American flag means something to me. America means something to me. It's my ha safe haven. It's heaven on earth. If you can't find what you're looking for here, you're not going to find it anywhere in this world. If you want to try it, you have the wonderful freedom to do so. Go out there and try and find it. As a little girl, I did not dream of Prince Charming coming on a white horse to carry me off to his castle. Instinctively, I knew I needed a lot more than that. I needed an American fighter pilot. <laughs> that <laughs> that would come, blow up everything in his path, and fly me to America in a fighter jet. <laughs> and I'm the luckiest woman alive to spend the rest of my life taking care of him and loving him. Um, so as you can see, we dreamed of Americans, American troops that would come to blow up everything blow up every board, every brick, every wall, until there was nothing left standing. Because everything was so corrupt, and the system was so evil, we didn't feel any of it was worth saving. And we would have been glad to die in the process. Because you see, the oppressed is the last one to judge the rescuers you may go out there and be in combat one day. And I want you to know, you're not going to hear this on TV. They're not going to tell you this, because it's, it's positive. The oppressed knows better than anyone in this world and understands that sometimes the rescuers have to do whatever they have to do in order to win. And it's OK. It's just life. It's just like surgery. Nobody likes surgery. But sometimes you just have to have it. And I want you to know that it's OK. Don't ever beat yourself up for doing whatever you have to do to stay alive and, and rescue people and win a fight. Because if you're going to go to war and fight for me, I don't want you to be in a fair fight, because I want you to win. And 
by the time we came to America, we were numb. We weren't dead, but we've never really been alive either. We died so many times that we didn't think it would be possible to ever feel alive. And yet somehow, with the unconditional love of the American people, the understanding, the kindness, we slowly came to life. And now we have everything we've ever wanted and more, thanks to you, America. And we, when we came, we landed in JFK, in New York. And, um, but before we could land, we were circling. And I'll never forget um, seeing the New York skyline that I dreamt about so many times. Um, the Statue of Liberty, the Twin Towers, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And all of a sudden, the airplane is turning away, it's flying away. And I was so paranoid. I was afraid that the communists were capable of um, playing this mind game to bring us close to America only to take us right back. And I panicked. I quickly unbuckled my seatbelt. I looked to the closest um, emergency exit door trying to see, figure out how I can open it and jump before they can take me back. Um, luckily, I didn't have to do it, <laughs> but I would rather be dead in America than ever live under oppression of any kind, but especially socialist, communist oppression. It is a lot worse than anyone can ever tell you. And they always, at the very beginning, in order to get you, they will tell you, these wonderful things, how great it is to get n something for nothing and to not work and you get all this free stuff. But always think and read between the lines. Where does the government get the money to do that? From we, the people. It's always from us. There's no such thing as government-sponsored program. It's all taxpayers that those are just words to fool you. So always think, read between the lines, and think for yourself. Don't listen to the TV. And um, I was born a warrior. I, I came out in shining armor. And in a hard, harsh world where we only learned to hate and fight, in America, I learned to forgive and love. And you have no idea how that changed my life in, in a wondrous way. It's, it's very hard to carry so much hatred. Um, New York was everything I ever wanted and imagined and more. Um, the, the abundance was overwhelming. There was more pet food <laughs> in the grocery stores than there was food in my hometown. And all that um, wealth did not make us bitter. We were glad to be a small part of a country that could make such wondrous things. And whenever I'm stuck in traffic, I feel so lucky because I look around and I think, that's wonderful, so many people can afford cars because my parents had to wait 10 years in line to get a car, and it was a horrible little communist-made car. It didn't have seat belts, um, no air conditioning, no, don't even uh, talk about sunroof. <laughs> um, no cup holders. Um, and here, I was able to get a car within a few months, making minimum salary, which in 1986 was $3.25, I bought a one-year-old red Nissan Sentra. And guess what? It had seat belts. I thought, wow, that's great. It had cup holders and air conditioning. And that's all standard here. It's just incredible how huge, uh, if you can, travel as much as you can, so you can appreciate what we have here. The level of living is so high that 
Even ho the homeless have cars here. And in Europe, the most of the middle class cannot afford cars because um, they're so expensive, they make so little money. And then the gas is outrageous. The price per gallon, it, you can't even dream. Um, and then you hear about the Nordic countries, how wonderful their socialist healthcare is, don't you? You hear it all the time. And how college is free there. But what they're not telling you, again, is that the government takes the money, whether you go to college or not, it comes out of your salary. And it goes to pay for everybody's college. So the reality is that it's, it's really not um, free college, is that everyone pays to college regardless of whether they go to college or not. The same with, I spend too much time in Germany, um, and um, you have to pay for a nursing home. You don't have a choice. It comes out of your salary, the government takes it out, and you get a fraction of the money you're making every month. So whenever you hear that the grass is greener in other countries, it's really not. Trust me on that. You can go find out for yourself. It's the best way. But you'd save yourself a lot of trouble if you just think of me. <laughs> um, and I have to say something that, um, again, you're not going to hear on TV. Americans are the best. And you, being in the American military, you are the best of the best. And why am I saying that? Because you're the only ones who go out there and fight for other people's freedom. And you never ask for anything in return. You always leave. And leave the, the places better than they were before. And I'd like you to remind you and always remember how the American Revolution started. That's why it's good to, to know history. The American Revolution started by armed Americans who would not give up their guns and refused to pay the outrageous high taxes. That DNA is in you. You've got it. Don't ever forget it. And that's very, very important. And now I'd like to put a face to the oppressed people from all over the world and say thank you. Thank you for everything you've done, you're doing, and you will be doing, not just for us here in America, but for the oppressed from all over the world. You are the best, and everything you do makes a huge difference. It makes the world a better place because Americans are in it. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you.